With Warhammer 3 still two months away, the only logical thing to do is to get good at Warhammer 2. I'm expecting most of this advice to carry over into Warhammer 3 anyway, so take notes. I'll be checking them afterwards. Since every faction plays like a different game, I decided to stick with general tips that apply to the entire game. Just for reference, all of these mechanics come from the vanilla game and may not apply to overhauls like SFO. Without further ado, here's a quick list of 10 unique campaign mechanics the game never explained to me. Obviously, you need 25% remaining campaign movement range to go into Ambush Stance, but when I started this game, I never used Ambush Stance because I figured it would only help if the AI happened to walk into you. However, Ambush Stance is also useful for pursuing weaker armies. The AI are smart enough to realize that if they fight a stronger army, they will lose. So if they see a stronger army approaching, they will continue running away. But if you go into Ambush Stance, they won't see you coming, and there's a good chance that the AI will stay put for a turn, allowing you to close in for the kill. Also, woods increase your ambush success chance by 25%. Here's some more free chicken. If you go into ambush stance too close to other factions or their heroes, it doesn't matter how high your ambush success chance is, there's a very good chance they will discover you. This is probably why the enemy AI will frequently have their heroes tail your armies. If you want your ambushes to succeed, try moving a little farther from these heroes before going into ambush stance. If you have a unit with siege attacker, you can attack a walled settlement as soon as you besiege it. If you don't have a siege attacker, you have to wait a whole turn to recruit a battering ram that you won't even use in the battle. On the higher difficulties, it's incredibly important to have a siege attacker in all of your armies because the AI can spawn a ton of armies in a short period of time. So you can't afford to wait two turns to take a settlement. One thing you probably haven't considered is that hero and lord mounts can also provide the siege attacker trait. For instance, in my last co-op campaign with Lynxy, Lynxy was playing as the Sisters of Twilight and he had them on the Great Eagle to save upkeep. But when he went to besiege a walled settlement, he couldn't right away because no one in his army had the siege attacker trait. Thankfully, Lynxy already had the dragon mount. So he swapped mounts on the same turn and he was able to attack the city without waiting to construct a battering ram. Most players know that you gain victory traits from defeating legendary lords on the battlefield, but newer players might not be aware that there are a ton of unique traits you can gather throughout the game by doing certain things on the campaign map. You can get the ambusher trait by spending multiple turns in ambush stance, you can get the taskmaster trait by spending multiple turns in force march, and you can get the campaigner trait by winning multiple battles excessively far from your capital. Also, it's worth mentioning that for whatever reason, the game won't let you have more than 40 traits on your lord. Any army that's not in Force March can retreat the first time they're attacked every turn. However, the only requirement that I'm aware of when an army retreats is that it has to move outside of the attacking army's zone of control and a little farther away. So if you attack a weaker army next to a river, there's a good chance that they will retreat behind the river, even though that movement would take 80% of their normal campaign movement. This means that you should avoid attacking weaker armies by rivers. You can also exploit this scenario as well if you find yourself up against a river and a stronger army. As larger factions like the High Elves or the Greenskins, it's pretty common to confederate other factions with legendary lords before you're ready to financially support them. But when you go to disband this lord, the normal command to do so doesn't appear. The easy fix for this is to go to the lord's details or skills page and go to the boot in the lower right corner of the screen. Use this icon to replace your lord with another generic lord and then you can disband that lord instead. One thing that experienced players know firsthand is the AI's preference for attacking armies in Force March. The AI cannot resist attacking these armies, even when they definitely shouldn't. One way you can cheese this mechanic is by recruiting a second army with just a lord and then placing them in Force March directly behind your main army. Then place your main army in Ambush Stance and profit. Changing the campaign difficulty increases your supply lines, decreases the enemy's upkeep, and decreases the time it takes for the AI to gain experience on their units. This ensures that the AI will always be able to recruit more armies than you. Campaign difficulty also gives the AI extra casualty replenishment and reduces the AI's damage from attrition. Battle difficulty changes the unit's stats on the battlefield. Neither of these difficulties make the AI more intelligent, they just make the AI beefier and more aggressive.
As you progress through the game, you'll start to naturally acquire a ton of followers, and it may seem like these followers are completely random, but that couldn't be farther from the truth. Every follower in the game has a specific chance of spawning after you perform a very specific action on the campaign map, and some of these actions are counterintuitive. For instance, if you win a battle as the humans or dwarves while you're not researching anything, you gain a student follower, increasing your faction's research rate. All of this information has already been compiled by Specific in his Ultimate Ancillary Guide. Link in the description. Some notes for understanding this guide. If you see this symbol, the follower can only go to a lord. And if you see this symbol, your heroes can equip the follower. If you see lord underlined like this, it means that only the lord initiating the attack has a chance of gaining the follower, and not the reinforcing lords. I don't care what your girlfriend tells you, size does matter. But bigger isn't necessarily better. There are four tiers of units, and this determines how easy it is for enemies to target your unit and how much mass your unit has. For unit size, Legend of Total War was able to prove that sometimes it's more effective to take a unit off of a mount in a pitched battle. This makes it harder for enemy archers to successfully hit the unit and reduces the total number of enemy melee units that can attack you at a given time. Understanding mass is just as important. If you have a handful of strong single entity units, you'll be able to perform hit and runs on enemy infantry all day long. But cavalry will be able to tie you down, and if you get caught by cavalry, the rest of the enemy army will catch up and wipe you out. Out. If you'd like to know more about this topic, Zerkovich also has a great video on it linked in the description. These icons confused me to no end when I first started the game, so I'll give you a quick rundown. Fire resistance reduces fire damage, missile resistance reduces missile damage, magic resistance reduces magic damage, and physical resistance, well, you get the idea. Ward save reduces everything. All of these resistances can add together with the exception of physical resistance and magical resistance, because these two are mutually exclusive, meaning that every attack in the game needs to be physical or magical, and no attack can be both. Lastly, these resistances can add up to a resistance cap of 90%. So if you have 10% ward save, 25% physical resistance, and 30% missile resistance, you'll be able to reduce an archer's damage by 65%. However, if the archer does magic damage, you will only be able to reduce the enemy's missile damage by 40%. If you're still confused, Legend of Total War has a great video on this topic, and the link is in the description. When I first started this game, I rarely globally recruited units because it takes so much longer than local recruitment. However, if you construct 10 or more buildings for a specific unit, it takes one less turn to globally recruit. And there it is, 10 pro gamer tips the game never explicitly taught me. Well, technically I talked about 11, but 10 looks better on a thumbnail. I'm sure there's plenty of mechanics I left out in this video, so if you think of any, let me know in the comments and I'll be sure to pin the most helpful one. Please check out the other incredible Warhammer creators I linked in the description. Y'all have a good one.